Hey everyone, Nick Dearbertis here teaching you financial modeling. Today we're going to be doing a math review as we get into our lecture segment on probabilistic modeling. So we talked last time about the an introduction to probabilistic modeling. What's it all about? Why do we want to do it? Now let's look at some mathematical tools that we need to be able to carry out this um, probabilistic modeling, adding probabilities to our financial models. So the first concept we'll look at here is uh, about random variables and whether that random variable is discrete or continuous. So discrete variables are having a certain set of values. It's, it's one of a certain set of values whereas continuous variables are defined by a range. It's between uh, two values, and it can be any number between those two values. Um, so, you know, something like an interest rate, you can think of as continuous. The rate could be 6%, 6 it could be 6.1%, it could be 6.111%, 6.1111, et etc. You can keep... Uh, Finding additional numbers in that range, it can be any number in the range of, of possible reasonable percentages. Um, so, and then discrete variables, um, taking one of a specific set of values. Um, so, it could be something like um, an example is maybe a, a Boolean variable like. Uh, take the project or don't take the project that only has two possible values uh yes i'm taking it or no i'm not taking it um and then uh, you can treat continuous variables as discrete in your model if it's helpful to simplify things like even though interest rate is continuous you might say uh, it's only going to take the values of 5, 6, or 7%. And then all of a sudden it becomes a discrete variable in your model, even though it's truly a continuous variable. Um, but you cannot go in the other direction. You cannot take a discrete variable and make it into a continuous variable in your model. Then thinking about expected value. Expected value is the average outcome over repeated trials. So it's the way that we can think of the outcome that we expect to happen. Um, you know, if you want to be able to put what's gonna happen into a single number, that's the expected value. Now it's not gonna be able to capture the risk of that um, result at all. You know, kind of what we've got coming out of our uh, original determined original deterministic models is basically like an expected value, um, but it only gives us a very small understanding of the distribution of possible results. But it's still very helpful to be able to give a single number which sums up the outcome that we're expecting. So uh, the calculation of it is a little bit different depending on whether the variable is discrete or continuous. So with a discrete variable, you take each possible outcome and you multiply it by the probability of that outcome. And then you sum each of those terms up. Whereas with continuous, uh, it's just an average across the outcomes which have occurred. Um, so we'll look at applying both of these uh, in our models throughout the course. Um, and then thinking about variance. So variance is what we're usually talking about when we think about the risk of a result. So variance is about how much the result is moving around. How much does it change from one occurrence to the next, etc. So this picture, I think, captures the concept of variance very well in that we have two different random variables here plotted uh, across the different instances, occurrences of the random variable. And those two variables have the same exact mean or average or expected value. 
where they differ is they have different variances. And you can look at that and you can clearly see those two lines look different. But you can also see, on average, they're both basically around zero. Uh, the orange line is, of course, moving up and down a lot more, but it's still basically centered around zero. So where it's centered, that's the average or expected value, that's the mean. And then the variance is how much it moves around that mean. So the orange line is moving a lot around it, it has a high variance. The blue line is moving a small amount around it. It has a small variance. And then as far as the calculation, um, so for a, uh, we'll just look at a continuous variable here. That's typically where you're going to need to do that. Um, so there's the formula there for the variance of a continuous variable. Each uh, occurrence minus the average um, summed up and then multiplying that by 1 over n minus 1 is going to get us the variance. Um, and then we typically talk about variance in terms of standard deviation rather than the uh, variance. Uh, and that's because the variance um, actually has units uh, in squared terms of the original variable, whereas the standard deviation has units in the original terms of the variable. Um, so the, um, the reason you know, being that um, you think about you've got like an investment return, um, say it has an average of 6%, um, it's going to be moving around that 6% with each observation based on the variance or standard deviation. And you might say it has a standard deviation of 2%, and so then you would expect most of the values to lie between like 4 and 8%. Um, sometimes they're going out to like 2 to 10%, and rarely they're going out to 0 to uh, 12%. Whereas the uh, variance for that would then be like 0. 0.0004, because it's squared percentage, uh, which is a re weird unit to work with and is hard to understand in terms of our original variable. So that's why we just take the square root of variance and that gets us the standard deviation. Um, and there is actually a squared term missing on this formula. There should be a squared there. Um, and that's why we get the squared units. So then um, moving on to the um, probability distributions is the next concept. So probability distributions tell you about the likelihood of different outcomes of a given random variable. Um, and the way that it looks is different depending on whether it's a discrete or a continuous variable. So for a discrete variable, you can basically think of the probability distribution being a table where we have each possible outcome in the table and then each probability associated with each of those outcomes uh, and that defines the probability distribution. Because there's only a fixed number of possible values, you just put a percentage to each, and then you have a probability distribution. For continuous variables, it's going to be in the form of a curve instead, and so typically those are represented by a graph rather than with a table, because there's actually a um, function which takes the... Um, which converts the um, probability into the outcome, um, and that's what defines the probability distribution. Um, but you can just know that it's continuous, it's going to be formed by a curve, um, and higher points on that curve means a more likely uh, outcome. So then we're talking specifically about the normal distribution as a type of probability distribution for continuous variables. And you've probably heard about the normal distribution before because it's very common in nature. 
And that's because of the central limit theorem, which is extremely powerful and important, which says that any average of random variables is going to be normally distributed, regardless of the distribution of those original random variables that you averaged. And that's, that's very, very powerful because all of a sudden, no matter what that crazy distribution there is in the original variable, you just average it across a few different um, sets, and then you've got a normal distribution, which we know how to work with. Um, so this has tons and tons of applications. Um, for example, thinking about an investment return, um, you know, what's the true distribution of any individual investment? It's really hard to say, but for an investment return, we can view that as the return on a portfolio of investments where each of those individual investments is itself a random variable. And those distributions can be whatever they are, but by the time we take those all and put them into a portfolio return, it's averaging across the individual investments. Now our portfolio return has a normal distribution regardless of the distributions of the original returns. So kind of the outcome from that is that the majority of the time we can use a normal distribution and it's going to be a good choice of distribution for whatever random variable that we're looking at because most variables can be thought of an aggregation of uh, more individual random variables. So if you're not sure what distribution to pick, just pick the normal distribution and most of the time that's going to be a reasonable assumption. Um, so then this, this, uh, slide is just, um, hitting home this concept of discrete versus continuous and how you can treat a continuous variable as discrete within your model, or you can treat it as continuous. Um, and this is basically saying that we would take our existing, uh, retirement model instead of just having interest rate as an input, uh, one particular value we can make it a random variable in the model. So we can either treat it as continuous and draw that um, return from a normal distribution with a certain average and a certain uh, variance or standard deviation. So we could say it's it's gonna be 5% with a 2%, 5% mean, 2% standard deviation, normal distribution. Um, or we can treat it as a discrete variable uh, here We've got three different possible values for the interest rate and three different probabilities for each. So this is also um, showing you how the difference in the probability distributions are when you treat it as continuous versus discrete. Discrete, we've got a table with the probabilities associated with the outcomes and continuous, it's defined by a distribution. So that concludes the math review for probabilistic modeling. We'll come back next time to talk about scenario analysis. So thanks for listening and see you next time.